Welcome to the stream, Weedicus. How are you doing tonight? Have you played much of this game before? If you once energetic, energetic Mender approaches, looking both worn and troubled. I'm not sure I thank you for the time to recover. I've never woven a spell that strong before. Are you sure you're ready to move on? You look... I know, I caught my reflection earlier. It's a more mature look. The mender grins and a hint of his former youth shines through. Not everyone would have stopped for so long. Especially with the ground rumbling like it has. We'll get there no matter how long it takes. I'm glad you feel that way, but crumbling mountains and chasms might be a sign to move faster than slower. You give a smile that doesn't quite reach your eyes. Right, well, thanks again. He walks off, glancing back at you only once. It's a lot of fun. Um, and the hard mode is definitely tough. We, I just lost my first battle there. Um, ended up, they ended up pillaging and taking half of my supplies. But a metal clanking is heard in the distance and grows louder. You see a yak's cart surrounded by four varl and an older woman hitting a ladle against a pan. All sorts of things for sale, she says, but her eyes go wide when she looks at you. It's you. Special deals when it comes to you. How do you know me? Word travels fast, she says. Think you can slay a sunder and keep it secret? She clicks her tongue and shakes her head. Mudder knows of you, sure enough. Why are you out here selling things? Mudder sells things to those traveling, she says. That's what she does. Used to be as generous as Asalai. Mudder was. But that don't buy most more supplies. Let me see what you have. Of course, Matter says, but make up your mind. Matter will be gone as quick as she arrived. And don't get any ideas of sneaking off with things. These four Varl have the keenest eyes, the sharpest blades, and the shortest tempers. You feel the Varl watching your every move. Okay. <clears throat> so what do they have for sale? So right now, looks like we need about um, three renown worth to get one extra day of supplies. Oops. We have one level 10 item, the same one that we had seen before. It ups your plus three to all of your talent ranks, plus one to strength, plus one to break. This one gives you three armor, divert armor attack, plus one to all ranks. Let's see. We might grab this one, try to put it on one of our tanky characters. It's going to be a long time before we get anyone up to level 10 in order for them to use this item. So let's give this one a shot. And let's rest, because we want to keep our morale high so that we can get, we can use more abilities in fights. Okay. So we have a lot of people that can be promoted. Get our main guys up here. And okay, so let's just give him that. Try it out. We'll have to level them up one more time so that we can get uh, these bonus armor points, or talent points, sorry. So, might as well do that now. So he gets plus two to armor talent ranks. There's two ranks for every ability. This was newly added into the second game that wasn't in the first. Um, so we can either choose at rank one, 20% to resist armor one armor damage. Or Titan Straps, 20% to regen one armor per turn. Now, you can increase these past rank 3 with um, your special, uh, w with your items. So, if we max this to 30, and we got plus 2, 
You'll be sitting at 40% to regen one armor a turn. Can't be that bad. Or 20% to, to resist five armor damage. Armor damage usually isn't much more than four, so I wouldn't see it being that useful, being pumped all the way up. But we can throw one here and just see how often it comes into play. Because right now it just jumps straight up to rank three. So we'll do that. And what else do we got here? We'll just leave it there for now. Okay, let's hit the road. Let's see what the prince has to say. So the prince is acting even more standoffish than usual. You and Ivor have caught him staring ahead and twisting the ring on his finger, over and over. Ursa qu quietly stands nearby. Glad to be heading home? Luden turns to the two of you and offers a polite smile. Even after that chasm, would it surprise you if I said no? I thought you hated being so far from the capital. Life on the trail hasn't won me over, but it's not all bad. It's even possible that I've learned a few things about leading people while out here. You, Ivor, and Ursa are stunned to hear the prince talk this way. I've grown up in comfort, trained with scholars and fighters. I've never known anything else. Saying stuff like that won't make you any friends in this caravan. But that's just it. Among these clansmen, I've seen the difference. I think I understand them a bit more. Oh yeah? What exactly do you understand? It seems they know just as little about the things I know as I do about the things they know. For instance, they know almost nothing about the kingdom's economy, and I know very little about making the things they sell. I know the trade routes, but they know the trade. You've never seen the prince this animated, but then his face falls. I just don't think the king will appreciate my knowledge. Ursa will agree, my father's not what you call open-minded. The king's a hard man, has to be, but his son is his weakness. The prince is the king's weakness. Don't listen to her. Watch your words, Prince. What? I wasn't telling you what to do. An awkward, icy moment passes between the Prince and his bodyguard. Mainoff was fearful of sending Luden away, so he sent his two advisors to watch him. You're one of the King you're one of King Mainoff's advisors. Ursa gives you a wry smile. Regardless of who he sent to protect me, I had no say in the matter. Kings usually have to make tough decisions and stick with them. Maybe someday you'll see why. I know, I just didn't think he'll care for my ideas on treating with peasant, commoners. Well, what would you like to be called? We're all people, Prince, even you. Perhaps you're right. Just keep an open mind about your father, the way I'd like him to have towards your ideas. That's something I've never considered before, I'll think on it. As Prince Luden and Ursa walks away, you feel Ivor watching you. What? Do you believe half of the nonsense that you said? I think I sounded really wise just then. It sounded like you'd been practicing it for a while. That's fair. I'll work on it. Two of you share a smile before moving on. Okay. Rest for a day. Get our morale up a bit. Hit the road. Easy boy, the clansman shouts as a yox cart nearly topples to one side. The tamp path of the Eastway Road has steadily turned into a crag's sham. Looking ahead, it only gets worse. Various chasms gape like open mouths. You glance back to Ivan, who looks at you and shakes his head. The entire caravan comes to a halt. We'll be eating our belts before finding a way across this broken road, especially with this many. And there's no telling how far we'd have to backtrack to head north. We'll head south across the Orms Ormsa riverbed. We can head towards Grundar on the west. Trugvi peers around, Akon's elbow, before coming fully into view. Heading south is questionable. Those people. Well, why do you say that? Maybe I spent a lifetime there. Plenty of things to eat under logs, but there's also people in the bogs. His eyes go wide. The skull should hear my rhyme. But what's wrong with heading south? Different ways of living, old ways. Stick to the mud, and Craigsmen are less bother bothersome. 
I think he's talking about the boggers, the rough, backward people of Swartzbog. Should be found at, at Ivor. Words like that can find you swollen, filled with poison. He puffs out his cheeks and stares at Ivor. This is why Varl tend to keep to themselves. Each human is crazy in their own way. Trigvi hunches over with laughter until he sudden, suddenly stops, sniffs the air, and marches away. Strange, but it's a fair warning. We are crossing over into lands most of us have never seen. Just because we left those dredge behind doesn't mean we won't have more wars ahead of us. If we had more supplies, I'd say we should stop for a few days and train up some of these clansmen to fight. You consider your options. Let's just camp. We'll consider training clansmen later. Call for camp spread down spreads down the line. So I just called I just camped for two days. I should have probably camped for two days and trained these guys up to fight. But we'll hit the road. Game trail, one of the few gathered hunters say, looking at the beating path, the beaten path of grass. No telling what we might find down it, but it'll fill, some, but it'll fill some stomachs. Let the hunters hunt. Make a wager for who will bring back the biggest kill, or keep moving. Let's make a wager. Everyone in the group starts smiling and tossing coins in a purse before heading down the trail. When it branches, two hunters sprint left, and three think the center trail looks promising. You consider what to do. Search for clues, follow the hunters to the left, follow down the center, and take off to the right. Let's take off to the right. You choose to hunt alone and move down the path quietly. Sure enough, a couple of harriers bolt for cover before you can sight them. But it's not you they're afraid of. The scent hits you as a bear crashes through the brush nearby. You instinctly, instinctively aim and fire, scoring a shot no one will ever believe. You shoot 537 pounds of meat. However, you were only able to carry 100 pounds back to the caravan. One hunter was wounded, but it will heal. The two others brought back a large boar, but you are clearly the victor. You give everyone back their coin, and drinks are shared while the injured man's leg is mended. Later, the entire caravan enjoys the stories of the hunt while feasting. I wonder if I would have found the bear if I went with other people and been able to carry back more, or if I would have just found something smaller. So once you cross the Ormsa riverbed, the wind ceases to cut through the humid air. The darkening sky lets loose its rain, and soon, fat drops of water turn the dirt path to sucking mud, slowing the caravan. Cloaks are pulled overhead, and children and animals are wrangled near the carts. So what we just saw was our clansmen actually can gather food while we're marching to help keep our army fed, but in times of war, like if there's a large battle, it all comes down to how many fighters we have and how many varl to see how difficult the fight will be. So I was hoping to avoid visiting this part of the kingdom for at least a few more years, Prince Luden says. At least others have had the sense to abandon the cesspool. As arrogant as he sounds, he's right. There are very few signs of life around you, yet you still feel like you're being watched. The lowing of the usually quiet yox indicates the beast's difficulty pulling the carts. You're up to your knees in, in it when a scout comes to you. Found some stone markers that lead us to a, a few paths of solid ground over there. He points while shouting over the ox. Uneven and bumpy, but it's easier than this. Stone markers. Yeah, the man says. Don't look natural. Don't look like much of anything else, either. Just some stones marking a path to this place. It's all I figured. You would ask Trivi, but he's nowhere around. Probably out gathering mushrooms. So, at the very beginning of the chapter, Trigby, that spearman, came up to us. And he said, stick to the mud, and people won't bother you. Could be more trouble than it's worth. Let's push on. The man looks surprised, but shrugs it off. The rain continues, and the caravan struggles to keep moving. I say this because I've done the other thing, so I'm not going to spoil it for you guys. 
Go ahead, press on down that nice path and see what happens to you. So someone's son is missing, Hagar says, motioning to a crowd, shouting a boy's name. A man with bleary eyes looks at you and says, He's my only son. He treats his white goat like his best friend. It must have wandered off, and he's out there looking for it. The man looks across the rainy bog. I've got to find my boy. Wait here, Aver. I will find him. I'll remember to send someone else to you with bad news from now on, Ivor says as the two of you slop through the mud. After a way, you see the boy in the distance. He's pulling on a rope leash around the goat's neck. The goat is up to its shoulders in mud. Come on, boy, what's wrong? You hear the child ask the goat. You're sinking, come on. You have to try. You cannot move any faster to help, and soon only the goat's head is visible. The boy shouts again. You're my friend, you stupid goat. You're, you're going to die. Tears roll down the boy's face as he sinks up to his neck in the mud. You are ahead of Ivor, but already waist deep, and a few yards away. Ivor is up to his knees. Ivor, can you reach them? Just before the goat and boy vanish beneath the surface, Ivor leaps towards the two, creating a huge wave of blood that splashes you. When you clear your face enough to see again, Ivor is there with the goat under his arm and the boy clinging to the giant's neck. The child thanks Ivor many times on the way back to the caravan, calling him a Lakovarl. Ivor spits mud and curses. So I'm pretty sure if we would have extended the bow, we probably would have only saved the child. But who knows, you'd have to give it a shot.